How's it going, Spare Parts Army? I'm your average Iraq war veteran, Chris Cappy. Remember that time when the US sent a bunch of next generation man portable surface to air missiles to a smaller country being invaded by Russia? It was when Johnny Depp was going through a high profile divorce. No, I'm not talking about today with Ukraine. I'm talking about the other time all those things happened 20 years ago in the 1980s. What do you mean that was 40 years ago? I'm old. So at the time, the US was covertly sending Stinger missile systems to Afghanistan. This was at the height of the Cold War, and the US was doing its best to prevent the spread of that dang communism. Today, Russia is claiming they want to stop the spread of democracy, like how the US was trying to stop the spread of communism in the 80s. So, did the Russians learn nothing from their occupation of Afghanistan? Stingers are being used in Ukraine almost 40 years later. How have they evolved? And do they need to be replaced? Load your infrared homing surface to air missile and lock onto the like and subscribe button because in this video, we're gonna tell the story of how these weapons made their way onto the battlefield and answer all of your questions about the FIM-92 Stinger missile. We talk a lot about militaries that invest in upgrading their capabilities, but when's the last time I upgraded my personal equipment that I carry on me every day? I was still using an old wallet designed in the 1990s, but no longer, thanks to the great people at Ridge Wallet. This video is brought to you by the Ridge Wallet. It's incredibly lightweight and practical, designed to make your life easier. Guys, Father's Day is coming up, and this next generation wallet is the perfect gift for them. Trust me, I got one from my dad, Papa Cappy, and he loves that it has the RFID blocking technology that protects you from digital pickpockets. Look how much smaller it is than your traditional gross wallet. There are a lot of different styles to choose from. I went with the red and black forged ember titanium. I love the wallet because it easily fits into my pocket, unlike my ancient old one. Ridge Wallet has a lifetime warranty and 40,000 five-star reviews. Our viewers get a special 15% off by clicking the link in the description or using code TASK at checkout. Again, that's TASK for 15% off. So where did this missile come from? The Stinger is actually a second generation air defense missile, which was originally developed to increase the capabilities of the first generation launcher, and it added more capabilities with its targeting computer or seeker the most notable being the ability to track targets approaching the operator. Originally nicknamed Red Eye 2, it was officially given the name FIM-92 Stinger in 1972. While there are variants of the Stinger that can be mounted to various vehicles, I'm gonna focus on the use of the man-portable version. In the military world, these anti-air systems haven't gotten a lot of attention in decades because US ground forces haven't been in KIA by enemy aircraft since 1953. It's a luxury that has caused the US military to get complacent about anti-air defense. This is why the Department of Defense hasn't placed a proper order for Stinger missiles in over 20 years and why the world is facing a shortage of the weapons today. The original version of the Stinger was first issued to troops around 1975, and our story picks up around 10 years later, when the Soviet Union invaded and occupied Afghanistan in 1979. US politicians were always afraid of starting a kinetic war with the Soviet Union. The CIA was very entangled in the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, and they were interested in solving a specific problem. You see, the Afghan fighters were being decimated by Soviet equipment, and specifically by their aircraft. Luckily for them, the CIA was doing their best to transport these new missile launchers that were capable of defeating Soviet air assets. The supply chain worked itself out because the Pakistan leaders at the time were open to the idea of shipping weapons in through its border. But there was a problem. The Stinger is not as simple as the missiles of today. It still involves a fair amount of training. There was no internet at the time especially not in Afghanistan. So it's not like you could watch a six minute video tutorial and be ready to go. The US had sophisticated simulators located in El Paso, Texas, where you stand in a dome and you can train on the Stinger. So what do you do? You can't send a pack of Mujahideen fighters to a commercial aircraft to Texas, and you can't build a special training system in Afghanistan or Pakistan. It's just not gonna work, and it almost didn't. The CIA wanted to send these stingers to the Mujahideen, but they were almost ready to cancel the whole project. So the CIA is about ready to throw in the towel and give up completely, and then one CIA operator comes up with a great idea, a $16 training aid solution that might work. You see, nowadays, they have portable VR headsets that you can easily ship covertly for Stinger training. But back in the 1980s, the only thing available was model aircraft. 
So an unnamed member of the CIA figured out this really inexpensive solution where you basically make a zip line between two buildings and attach a model aircraft with a flashlight so that the missile can track it and you can just let gravity do its thing. The seeker tracks the flashlight using an IR sensor. We found that story from a former CIA operator named Basil Baz who did an interview over at the Team House YouTube channel. It's worth listening to. Wait a second, I've seen that exact same BMP before somewhere. They were using that in Ukraine. It's estimated that on average, one Soviet aircraft a day was being destroyed in Soviet Afghan war. And this is huge. Not only does this cause massive casualties, but you're using a missile that costs $38,000 and destroying Soviet aircraft that costs literally millions of dollars. This loss has a huge impact on the morale of Soviet troops. It's said that Soviet transport pilots would outright refuse to fly missions. And some people make the claim that the Stinger missile is the straw that broke the camel's back. The US sent 2,000 Stinger missiles over the course of the decades long war. The Soviets lost an estimated 333 helicopters and 118 jets during the war. It's hard to imagine what would have happened to the US forces in Iraq and Afghanistan if Russia and China were overtly arming the opposition with anti-air and anti-armor weapons. This isn't to say that they weren't arming the enemies of the US in those countries, they were, but it wasn't to such a massive extent. The CIA claimed that they had a 70% hit rate against Soviet aircraft, but some of the Mujahideen claimed that it wasn't nearly that effective and that those were just overblown, overhyped statistics trying to give America the claim for their victory. I like to try to give both sides of the argument here and I wanna tell you that this is the other side of the story here. Even if it didn't hit at that high rate, it still forced Russian jets to fly higher, bomb from higher up, and be less accurate. So you would think with the weapons proving to turn the tide in Afghanistan that the US would have a lot of Stinger missile units, but the truth is as of August 2015, the army only had four active duty ADA battalions. The way Stinger missile platoons work is that they're organic to each of these three anti-air missile batteries. Between its creation and today, all of the anti-air units have gotten somewhat of a backseat role in the US military's warfare because it was a threat that was never remotely close to becoming a reality. The US military rarely fought against an enemy with serious air power. But what kind of specifications made the Stinger so useful that defense companies can't even physically produce enough of them now? The Stinger is a weapon system originally developed by General Dynamics and produced by Raytheon. One complete Stinger package weighs around 30 pounds, and while the missile itself weighs 22 pounds, it's fairly heavy, but still possible to hump around on an infantryman's back. The missile has a diameter of 70 millimeters, and it's five feet in length. A full Stinger package includes the missile itself, launch tube, and internal sight. The launch tube is fitted with a grip stock and identification friend or foe antenna, or IFF. And inside the grip stop is the BCU, or battery coolant unit. The BCU only works for 45 seconds and needs to be switched out even if you haven't fired the missile. It is full of high pressure argon gas that cools the weapon to extreme temperatures, but it's known to have leakages and a short shelf life due to the leakages. The missile unit contains four sections, the seeker, one pound warhead, a solid rocket booster, and a launch motor. This is why you see an initial launch out of the tube when fired. And then the launch motor has a stage separation and the solid rocket booster travels the rest of the way to the target. The Stinger uses an IR or infrared sensor to track heat signatures. This sensor helps do some calculations while in flight, which is called proportional navigation, and ensures the missile can hit a moving target. After an operator fires the Stinger, it truly is a fire and forget weapon. It makes the calculations on its own, and it has some great benefits over older wire-guided and radio-guided missiles. Modern countermeasures on aircraft often include flares that can match an engine's heat signature and can defeat IR sensors. Bad news for the Stinger. That's why one of the Stinger's upgrades is an added UV sensor, and almost every single upgrade includes improvements to help defeat these countermeasures. It's been a constant evolution of identifying countermeasures and then figuring out how to defeat them. And there's another factor of why modern countermeasures struggle with defeating Stinger missiles. The Stinger is in a category of short range air defense missiles, meaning that aircraft have to be relatively close. 
and most of the time, they're only a few hundred meters away. The max speed of a Stinger missile is Mach 2.5. That's really fast. Basically, the Stinger at max speed can travel 750 meters in one second. And with a max range of 4,500 meters, aircraft really don't have enough time to engage their surface-to-air countermeasures before they're hit by this missile. Another really cool feature of the Stinger is the friend or foe antenna, which reminds me of playing a video game. It prevents friendly fire incidents. And incredibly, certain aircraft like the MiG, Su, and Tu all have special status, which makes them instantly marked as a foe by the missile's tracking system. What's cool about this antenna is twofold. For one, it prevents an average infantryman like me from blowing up multi-million dollar American-made aircraft, but it also prevents our enemy from using it on anything other than enemy aircraft. As you can see, because of all the upgrades, the Stinger doesn't have any trouble competing with modern countermeasure used by aircraft. The Stinger was able to bring a first-rate army to its knees in the 1980s. The ability to field a weapon that can defeat a multi-million dollar aircraft cannot be overstated. There's a recent example of this in Ukraine 2022, where a Ukrainian manned Stinger took out a Russian Su-30. If you do simple math, the Stinger is today's money, 120,000, and the Su-30 is worth around $40 million in US. That means the Ukrainians destroyed a jet with a missile that is 250 times cheaper. This really highlights why the Stinger and other man portable missiles in general are equalizers on the battlefield. The US military sent so many of their Stinger missiles that it's been estimated by analysts that we gave around 25% of our stockpile to Ukraine. This means we're starting to reach a point where we're unable to support our obligations in the event of a major war breaking out. In April 2022, Raytheon CEO Greg Hayes told investors on a call that the company was experiencing supply chain problems and that they were going to be unable to increase production of Stinger missiles immediately. In fact, he estimated it would take until 2023 to start producing them in mass numbers again. This is likely because of the chip shortage that is happening right now, and there are a lot of sensors and computer chips in the sophisticated Stinger missiles warhead. Thousands of Stingers were pulled from stockpiles across Europe to arm Ukraine, including 500 from Germany, 300 from Denmark, and 200 from the Netherlands. The US had sent over 2,000 Stingers to Ukraine. Oddly enough, that's exactly how many Stinger missiles were sent by the CIA to Afghanistan in the 1980s. According to them, the Ukrainian armed forces have shot down 171 planes and 150 helicopters. We're uncertain how many of those were shot down using Stingers, but even if those numbers are only approximately accurate, it's impressive. I think part of the reason why these systems surprised us by how effective they were is because the world had never really seen them used at this scale before against the conventional enemy, and it hasn't been done in the modern information era where everyone can see the evidence of these weapons are insanely effective in Ukraine on their phones all over the internet. Whereas in the 1980s, Russia could somewhat hide their losses in Afghanistan. The Stinger missile shortage is having a ripple effect to other conflicts. The US was supposed to send 250 of these missiles to Taiwan by 2026, but Chu Wang Wu, the deputy head of Taiwan's army planning department, said that those will probably be delayed now. But the fact of the matter is the Stinger is an aging weapon. The US had been looking for a replacement for several years. The reason I mentioned earlier about argon gas leakage and the short shelf life, plus the required training, means that this isn't necessarily the best model for export. The US government probably wants to develop something that's easier to use and has a longer shelf life. If you like this video, let me know and we'll do one covering the Soviet counterpart called the 9K38 IGLA, which is the Russian Army's Cold War era equivalent anti-air weapon. So what do you think? Is the Stinger still good to go or does it need to be replaced? If there's anything I've missed, let me know in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching Task and Purpose. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy.